Hey, good morning and welcome to worship at Hespler Baptist. If you want to come on in and find a place to sit and wave at your friends and not talk to them quite so much until after the service, that's great. But I love hearing the conversations that are going on as I walk in and just the, the hubbub of talk as, as people connect. I just really appreciate that. Uh, before we call to worship, I have a, a few announcements. This is a family Sunday, so we're welcoming children into the service. Children, I hope that you have your clipboards with activities on them, and if you didn't get one, maybe your parents could run out to the table and, and grab you one quick. So welcome to children and kids here today. Also, if you are on camp staff, Josh has your t-shirts ready. If you could see Josh after the service, he's sitting right over there, but, but he'll be actually out there after the service, and you can get your t-shirts from him. Uh, we have the Lord's Supper today, so just be preparing your hearts. You know, this is not an add-on that we simply do once per month, but the Lord's Supper is an important milestone. It's an important remembrance for us of the Lord's coming and of his death and resurrection and his salvation for us until he comes again. So this whole service is, is, going, to be, is going to be aiming towards remembering Christ and also, during the Lord's Supper, we're going to be starting to take up a benevolence offering again. So, as you heard from Tom Gowing last week, who is the Deacon of Mercy, and he actually runs, uh, along with his committee, this fund, which helps our own people and people in our sphere of influence with financial and physical needs. We will be taking up a special offering besides the offering for the church during the Lord's Supper to raise money for that fund. So just keep that in mind as well. And then we're going to hear, of course, Sean preach from Genesis 40 today. So let me open us with prayer, and then I'm going to, well, actually, let me make the call to worship, and then I will open us with prayer. So I want to draw our attention here to Acts and something that's going on here, and another reason why we gather weekly for worship. And they devoted themselves, the church, and the church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all, pe all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so what we see in this picture is the church gathering to care for one another, to worship the Lord, to praise him, and it is a witness to all of those around them. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day. And I think as we gather here as a community of faith in Jesus to praise him and to care for one another, we are a witness to the world of a different kind of community that is available for them to join. And there is great curiosity when the world sees the church gathered. And so when we worship Christ together today, we are a witness to the world of a different kind of community. And we want to be a witness to the world of Jesus Christ as we praise him today. So welcome to worship. I'm glad you're here. Join us in voice. Join us as we hear God's word. Let me pray for us as we get started, and I'll invite the worship team to come on up. Heavenly Father, we just ask for grace today, grace that our hearts would be moved to put aside the distractions of our, of our morning, of our week, Put aside the things that have preoccupied our minds and help us to focus our hearts on you today, that we would worship you with whole hearts, that we would appreciate all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ, and that we would, we would turn to him, think on him, love him, and that we would hear from you today, that the eyes and the ears of our hearts would be opened to receive your word with gladness, to receive it, let it take root and bear fruit in our lives and in the lives of others that we know. And we help each other to grow up into maturity in Christ. And would this service contribute to our knowledge, our wisdom, and our love for you. 
And we, as we lift our voice in praise, would you do this for us in your son's name? Amen. Well, good morning. I'd add my uh, welcome to Kevin's. Um, I've just spent uh, a week in the Rocky Mountains of BC and Alberta and just a rich week full of breathtaking, stunning views of the mountains. Uh, God imagined those and created them by his, uh, by his power, by a word. And uh, uh, yeah, he's, he's so big and mighty and so powerful and, and yet He's made himself small. He's taken the form of man and, uh, and, and pursued a personal relationship with us. Um, so we're going to begin our service by a couple songs um, meditating on God's greatness and uh, his, his kindness and his strength. So why don't you uh, please stand to sing with us. singing. As we continue to sing, the uh, ushers are going to come forward to collect the offering. And uh, boys and girls, uh, the next two songs will probably be more familiar to you. So if you know them, please sing them out. And if you know some actions, you can do those as well. I can't do that, but hopefully you can. <clears throat> Oh, 
Good morning, Hespler Baptist Church. I looked back at one time to see if anybody was doing the, the actions, and I don't think I saw too many people, but that's okay. I heard your voices, but it is a privilege, and it's an honor, and a uh, solemn responsibility, and thank you for allowing me to uh, bring us as a congregation before the throne of God. Allow me to be your voice as we pray. Let's pray. Father, you are indeed a great and good God, and there is nothing that you cannot do. Thank you for revealing yourself so plainly to us through your creation, through your word, and through your Son. You are over all, and through all, and in all things, and you providentially work to affect your purpose and plan in all things. Father, it is amazing to think that you created us in your image and in your likeness. Help us to see that being made image bearers compels us to treat others with dignity, respect, and love, and speaks to issues like racism, abortion, self-identification, 
homelessness, disabilities, and many more. Help us to love others as Christ has first loved us. Help us in the church. Help us in our church to deeply love one another and make and may how we treat one another be so attractive to our neighbors, to our friends, and to our families that they are compelled to ask us about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, as we think about STEM Club that starts tomorrow, and we think about all the kids both from our church that will come and from outside the church that will come, we pray that there will be many, many gospel moments where the impactful love of Jesus will be shared. Father, we pray for energy, for health, for patience, for the workers and volunteers. We pray for listening ears of the campers. We pray for good behavior and for the safety of the campers. We pray that through the efforts of this church, many souls will be called from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Father, it is our desire to raise up a next generation of Christ followers. And so we pray for the hiring committee that will be evaluating the applicants for the kids' ministry coordinator here at HBC. We pray that you would give Pastor Sean and Pastor Caleb, Jane, Shelley, and Taylor deep wisdom, discernment, love, and kindness through the hiring and interview process. We pray for the needs in our congregation. We want to lift up those who have health challenges. We want to lift up those whose body and mind aren't working like they used to. And why we know and we anticipate the day when all our infirmities will be healed and all our iniquities will be forgiven. We do believe, Father, that you do heal on this earth. And so we pray that you would indeed heal and you would bring comfort and perseverance to those who are suffering because of their health. We also want to pray for those who have experienced the death of a loved one this past week or even just this past weekend. Father, we pray as they journey through the valley of the shadow of death that they would sense your steadfast presence because you are indeed close to those who are brokenhearted. Finally, Father, we want to pray as Sean comes and preaches the word this morning that you will pour out your spirit upon us so that each one of us would have a transformative meeting with your son, Jesus Christ, which would then impact and change how we live from this day until we stand before your judgment seat. May we continue to be transformed toward holiness and into the image of your Son, and may we live to bring you glory. Father, we are children of God, so may we act like it. Father, be merciful to us. May your face shine upon us both this day and forevermore. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, right in the middle of the Scriptures. If you don't have your Bible this morning and you want to grab one of the blue Bibles in front of you, it's page 9, sorry, excuse me, 494. We are in Psalm 88. Pastor Sean asked me to read this one, and uh, this is indeed one of the darkest voices in the Bible. Uh, we have traveled through some rather dark voices in, in Genesis. We've seen Joseph being thrown in a pit. We've learned the story of Judah and Tamar. This week, Joseph is languishing in prison. And the Bible isn't always, as we talked about a few weeks ago, always just happy, upbeat, exciting times. There are times in Scripture where there are just dark voices. There are voices that have anguish and pain and darkness to them. And that's very fitting because so many times in our lives, we have those same emotions, those same feelings. And so we can actually and indeed turn to Scripture that speaks to our own pain. It speaks to our own languishing. It gives us words to speak as we cry out to God. And so let me read Psalm 88 for us this morning. It says this. It's a song, a song of the sons of Korah to the choir master according to the Mahalath Lehunath of Maskil of Haman the Ezrahite. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength. 
like one who sets loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all of your waves. Salah. You have caused my companies to shun me, and you have made a horror, me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Salah. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in abandon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dread assaults, your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friends to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, everybody to please stand. Uh, we're going to continue by singing a song um, of lament, of bringing our pain and struggle before God and expressing faith in him um, to do wisely. <clears throat>
Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Thank you, everyone, who has contributed to leading us to worship this morning. We're grateful for your gifts and abilities, the time that you give, your willingness to serve. Thank you for helping us as a part of the kingdom of priests and priestesses that the Lord Jesus Christ is making for himself as a praise to him, him and to his Father. It is a delight to, uh, to serve and worship together in making his name great among us. I see some faces this morning that I don't recognize, so maybe you don't recognize the faces that you're seeing up here. So my name is Sean. For those of you who don't know me, I serve as one of the pastors here in the lead role, and it's a joy and privilege to do so. And if you're new to us or we're new to you, then there's a way for you to be in touch. There's some brand new cards in front of you with the word connect on them. Uh, Please fill them out if you want to be connected here in any way, and we would gladly follow up with you and get you connected and get connected with you and find ways to start uh, enfolding you into the life of uh, our congregation, Uh, we would delight to do nothing more. So please uh, take that invitation up and put that back into our hands. As it's a family Sunday, before I begin proper with this portion of our service, the sermon, I just want to say a few words to the boys and girls, the moms and dads, and to everyone else. This does not count as sermon time. I assured my wife of that this morning when I left. I realize it's a family Sunday, but there's a great opportunity here, and so I just want to take it. So the boys and girls, I just want you to look up here for a moment. And I, wanted to, I want to say that I'm so very glad that you are here in the room with us today. I want to help you understand why you're here and not downstairs. And it's this. With your parents, I hope and pray that if you're not already a follower of Jesus Christ, that you will soon become one. And one of the ways that we worship Jesus is by meeting like this, as Pastor Kevin told us, to worship him by singing and praying and giving, listening to his word, coming around the Lord's table as we have communion. And boys and girls, you might hear thousands of sermons in your life, thousands, if Jesus doesn't come back. And so we want to teach you how to worship and how to listen at a young age because we believe that will help you for your whole entire life. So even though it's hard, I want you to try to be still and quiet and listen as much as you can. And those clipboards that you have and you're writing notes and you're counting how many times I say the word God or Jesus or those types of things, I want to see those at the end. If you've written things down, if you've drawn something, then bring them to me. I'd love to have a look because I want to let you in on a little secret. Kids can listen and understand to a whole lot more than sometimes adults think. And I believe that. And so I want you to come and show me and tell me anything that you heard or anything that you learned or any questions that you have this morning. And I also want you to help your parents because they want to listen. So work hard to be quiet and to be still and to help them to listen, okay? Now, moms and dads, please remember that you are making a long-term investment and we're making that with you. You might hear less of the sermon this morning than normal and that might be frustrating and seem pointless, but let me assure you, it is most certainly not. Your children are seeing you and hearing you sing and listen and have an open Bible, and they're seeing everyone else. And so if you get interrupted from listening up to 50 times or more between now and the end of the service, so be it. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Set the expectation that your kids will sit quietly and listen, and with a combination of love and grace and wisdom and patience and discipleship and discipline, hold them to it. And I'm serious. Set the expectation. Don't shirk your parental responsibility for their sake, for your sake, and for the sake of those around you. It's your responsibility. It's not easy, but it's worth it. And by God's grace, they'll get there. The best training ground is family worship Monday through Saturday. So build that in if you're not already doing so. And if you don't know how to do it, look around the room. There's lots of people in the trenches there with you. 
Many of us are in the thick of it. Many of us have been there. There's lots of help available. So don't give in. Don't lose heart. And church, if you're more distracted this morning than you are in other weeks, and if you're watching parents try and try and try, and there's still more noise than you would like, I would encourage you just to take a moment to praise God for those moms and dads and for those children, that they're here, which is the one place that we would wish them to be than any other place this morning. You're watching live discipleship take place. You're a part of it, so encourage and help in all the ways that you can, for we are in this together for God's sake and for the sake of the next generation. Amen? Amen. All right. Now I'm beginning the sermon. Let me just adjust this. It's driving me crazy. I'm not sure what person used this last time, Caleb, but it's not shaped in my head anymore. The first time I ever encountered the life of William Cooper was through John Piper's book, The Hidden Smile of God, The Fruit of Affliction and the Lives of John Bunyan, William Cooper, and David Brainerd. For those who have never heard of William Cooper before, for 13 years he was a member of the church where John Newton pastored, the author of Amazing Grace. And Cooper said of Newton, a sincerer or more affectionate friend no man ever had. For William, this was significant, for he suffered terribly from depression which Ed Welch calls the long, stubborn darkness. Sometimes for weeks, William would just sit and stare out the window for he could do nothing else. He attempted to take his own life on several occasions, yet God graciously intervened. Cooper experienced four seasons of depression in his life, spending at least one of them in an institution under the care of an evangelical doctor under whose influence he became a Christian. Throughout the dark nights of the soul that this man suffered, akin to Psalm 88, which we heard just a few moments before, throughout those dark nights of the soul, he wrote hymns and he wrote poems. We sing one of his hymns here as a church. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. The title of this morning's sermon is a line from one of his poems, which for me and for many others has become increasingly meaningful through life's twists and turns. I often listen to Matt Papa's version in his Church Songs album, and I couldn't count the number of times that these words go through my head, so much so that I try to actually be careful not to make you sick of them by overuse. But this morning, I couldn't resist. So I want you to hear them again, or perhaps hear them for the first time. This is one of the last poems that William Cooper ever wrote. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind the frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. Do you know who else could have written those beautiful words? Joseph. Joseph could have written those words. For the last several weeks, we have been following the mysterious ways of God in this young man's life through what certainly could be called a frowning providence. In this morning's episode, we follow Joseph to the deepest part of the long, difficult journey that Yahweh called him to travel. And what I want us to see while there with Joseph in this deepest, hardest moment is the hidden smile of God that I believe Joseph saw and experienced. What I want us to see with God's help is that when Yahweh's providence takes us through long, difficult valleys, that we can trust Him to supply us every single step of the way. 
you might be in one of those long, difficult valleys, and you have no idea how long it's going to last. You might soon go through one of those difficult valleys, and you have no idea when that might be. And you might be walking with someone who is going through a very deep and difficult valley. And so if we can see Yahweh at work in Joseph's life through his long, difficult valley, we will learn to trust the ways that Yahweh surely supplies us every step of the way through any twists and turns that his providence might lead us. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 40. We're going to cover the 23 verses of that chapter, and I'm going to leak a little bit into chapter 41, which Pastor Roger, who's preaching next week, won't mind because he's already complained bitterly about the 57 verses that I assigned to him for next week. But Genesis chapter 40, it's on page 33 of your blue Bibles. I'm going to read those verses, but as is my pattern, we want to ask God for help and illumination before we even read his word together. So Genesis 40, 1 to 23 is where we'll be, but let me first pray before we read. Lord God, I pray indeed that you would help us to cherish these moments. I pray, Lord, that they would be ever sweeter to us as we realize that there are younger ears than normal in our midst with us, and I pray, Lord, that you would grant all ages the capacity to be able to experience the power and work of your Spirit, filling the wind of my sails and the sails of hearers so that there is that quiet, still moment as your word is being preached so that nothing would hinder it reaching our ears and penetrating our hearts, for we know your word is as a double-edged sword, and that everything about us is laid bare before you. So you who know us, would you take and direct your words in all the ways that it needs to this morning, for the sanctification of the church, and for the salvation of any who may not be a Christian. This we ask in Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, amen. Genesis 40, beginning in verse 1. Sometime after this, which is Joseph being put in prison for being falsely accused of trying to sleep with Potiphar's wife, sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, And he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We've had dreams, and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore to you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me this kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of 
baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it all out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And just look at the first few words of chapter 41. After two whole years. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What we have just read together, including those first few words of Genesis 41, covers years 11, 12, and 13 of Joseph, of Joseph's slavery and imprisonment. And boys and girls, that's longer than many of you have been alive. Adults, maybe you've not been aware before of how long Joseph was in this valley. All in all, we've covered a decade from verses, uh, chapter 37, verse 12, to the end of chapter 39. He was 17 when we were reintroduced to him in Genesis 37, 2. And he was 30 when he entered Pharaoh's service, according to Genesis 41, 46, which, again, Roger will cover next week. Can you imagine how long this must have felt to this young man in the prime of his life, far from home, far from his family, his last memory of his brothers, their hatred towards him, the wrongful accusation of Potiphar's wife, and now he is years in prison. How does he survive? Not only that, how does he thrive? Well, because, as Pastor Caleb accurately highlighted last week from Genesis 39, verse 2 and 21 and 23, we are told again and again and again that Yahweh was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. Now, in chapter 40, I wish to draw out the specific ways this manifests in Joseph's life, not so that we are impressed by Joseph, whose life and faith I certainly admire, but so that we are impressed by the God who was with him in this long and difficult valley. For when we see the ways Yahweh supplied Joseph every step of the way through this so-called frowning providence, we will be able to look through our circumstances to the smiling face of our blessed God who supplies us with all that we need for every step of the way according to his glorious riches. So there are six in total that I very briefly want to work through. Consider the first of the ways I see God supplying all we need for every step through long and difficult valleys. When Yahweh's providence takes us through them, we can trust him to supply us with skill. The Lord provides his people with capacity, with ability, with capability for the circumstances that he leads us through. When Yahweh's providence takes us through long, difficult valleys, we can trust him to supply us with skill. We've seen this before in Joseph's life, and we see the same here again in the opening scene of this act in verse 1, which says that sometime after this, now Joseph's been in prison for a while, the cupbearer of Egypt and his baker, they commit an offense. We don't know what it is, but Pharaoh's ticked. He's actually enraged, and he throws them in prison, and he puts them in the custody in the house of the captain of the guard. As so often happens with men who hold absolute power, they're prone to fits of rage, and those who are under them can suffer as a result. And so these two important men in Pharaoh's house are the brunt of Pharaoh's anger for reasons Moses doesn't spell out. Now this just so happens, here we trace Yahweh's providence, to be, in verse 3, the prison where Joseph was confined. And because Yahweh was with Joseph in keeping with his covenant promises, we read there in verse 4 that the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with these men, and he attended them, and they all continued for some time in custody. It's Yahweh's enabling of Joseph meant that Joseph succeeded in everything that Yahweh intended, so much so when these high officials from Pharaoh's house are imprisoned, 
it's a no-brainer for the captain of the guard over who will be responsible for their oversight and care. It's Joseph. So for the sake of Joseph and for the sake of his redemptive purposes, Yahweh gives the young lad all he needs to thrive even in the midst of this long, difficult valley. And on the surface, that might not seem very significant or even that spiritual, but this was the Lord's equipping. Every day, Joseph woke up to the grind of confinement. Though a prisoner himself, he's capable of, that he's responsible for caring for other prisoners. And how many of us would be willing to swallow that bitter pill? To be a prisoner and then to be subservient to other prisoners who are ranked higher than you because they're Egyptians and you're not and they held high rank and you're a nothing. And yet day after day, Joseph embraces the skill that Yahweh endows him with to succeed in these trying circumstances. So, brothers and sisters, think hard and look hard at the ways that Yahweh has provided for you, even in your hardships. Perhaps you wake up every morning to the grind of unfulfilled hopes and dreams, busting your gut in a job that is far from first choice. But you're earning an income, and you're providing for a family, and Through it, you're resourcing the kingdom of God from your first fruits. You've been granted knowledge and skills to bring all of that home. Perhaps you've been granted skill to move up in your company, which is more responsibility than you may want, but which provides sufficient income to make up for the fact that your spouse can't work because of the long, difficult valley that they're going through. I doubt very much. If you were to ask Joseph at 17... Or maybe, boys and girls, someone asks you from time to time, what would you like to be when you grow up? I bet this was not even in a million years Joseph's answer. I want to be employee of the month in an Egyptian prison. That's what I wanted to be when I grow up. But Yahweh made him good at it for Joseph's sake and for the sake of his covenant people and for the sake of his promises. Because behind this frowning providence, what is going to happen next? We're going to see in a bright and glorious way the smiling face of God. And so will you broaden your vision to better trace out God's hand in these ways? Will you thank Him for the skill that He's given to you? Will you ask Him for success even in what seems as mundane when life takes a difficult turn? When Yahweh's providence takes us through long and hard valleys, we can trust him to supply us every step of the way. Firstly, with skill, and secondly, with compassion. The Lord will help us not to sink into a poor me mentality that prevents us from looking past our own selves and our own hardships. When Yahweh's providence takes us through long, difficult valleys, we can trust him to supply us with compassion. As the days go by, and the sense of the Hebrew at the end of verse 4 is that many days do go by, it seems that Joseph gets to know these two guys pretty well. We know this from the second scene in this act in verses 5 to 8, if you look there with me. These guys have a dream one night. They both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker. Each one had a dream, each with its own interpretation. And when Joseph comes in the, in the morning, he sees that they are troubled. And so he asks these guys, Why are your faces downcast? Your faces are are tripping you. What, What is going on? Now, I find this to be rather remarkable. Keeping in mind that we are 10 plus years into Joseph's journey down the well, down to Egypt, and down to prison, to see Joseph actually caring about the emotional well-being of two fellow prisoners is astounding. Wouldn't it be so easy to become bitter? Wouldn't it be so easy to just wall off emotions and withdraw into oneself because of all of the ways that, that, that we've been treated by others? Wouldn't it be easy just to become so callous and do the job and give the guys their morning rations and just get on with it? Joseph could have scorned these guys with a Crimea river or suck it up, or it could be worse. You could be me. But no. Please don't overlook the magnitude and magnificence of this question. Joseph displays the heart of Yahweh 
to those who are downcast under his charge, which is most certainly evidence that Yahweh was with him, that the Lord was supplying everything Joseph needed through this long and difficult valley. In New Testament terms, I would understand what Joseph is doing here as what Paul expresses at the beginning of 2 Corinthians. In the opening of that letter, he writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Brothers and sisters, through long and difficult valleys, the Lord provides us with comfort, as he evidently did with Joseph. And that comfort is not just for us. It's for others. If we trust the Lord in this, he will make us conduits of comfort, pipelines through which the Lord will cause to flow salve to the souls of fellow sufferers, And he will open those pipelines up. Why? By supplying us hearts of compassion for others. Boys and girls, we are reading at home these days the second book of Little Pilgrim's Big Journey. And that's what we're doing in our house. I'm reading it primarily to Isaiah, who's our three-year-old. But the older kids will look over my shoulder and they'll listen in as well. And the teenager will take the book and just read through it on his own because he's interested enough, which is great. But this week, we got to Interpreter's House. And out of the windows, Christiana, Mercy, Eli, and Jude, they see this scene, and I think it's going to be up behind me here, if we can put that up. They look out the window over Interpreter's House, and they see this. And the little boy, Eli, he looks out, and he says, and this is my Eli voice, those poor branches, doesn't it hurt them? Interpreter smiled and he said, he's pruning them so they'll bear more fruit when it's time for their grapes to grow. In the same way, the king uses difficulties to help us bear fruit. It may not feel good, it may not look good, but someday it will be good. The king is a good gardener, you can Trust him. And what is some of that fruit? Well, those who understand the comfort of the gospel, those who understand the extent to which they have been forgiven through the afflictions of Christ, those are the ones who are most ready and willing to share the gospel with others Not because they're in a a deep and difficult valley, but because they're in the pit and mired in sin, and they want to see them free and forgiven. The fruit is, is those who have drunk deeply from the well of God's character in the hardest of valleys. Those are the ones who are willing to descend into the valleys of others to show them where this life-giving water can be found. And this is what Joseph is doing. He steps down into the trouble of these men ten plus years into his own hardships because Yahweh was with him, supplying him in these ways. And we can trust him, and we should, to do the same work in us. There's a reason we're drawing to the po- drawn to the poems of uh, William Cooper, and there's a reason why people will read books by Joni Erickson Tata. There's a reason why we're drawn to those who have suffered and suffered well, and then who are willing to open up their comfort so that others can embrace it. And there's a reason why we're drawn to Jesus Christ. He was able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses like no one else can. Because he was made perfect through his sufferings, drawing sufferers and sinners to himself. And Joseph reflects this. And brothers and sisters, so ought we too as well. 
Now, the reason these men are upset, the reason why there's trouble for Joseph to step down into is given to us in verse 8. They said, we've had dreams, and there's no one to interpret them. In Egyptian culture, there were... There, there was uh, uh, interpreting dreams was a highly technical, highly trained occupation. There were manuals, and people studied these things. And so these guys know for sure, because they both had dreams, these guys know for sure that their futures have been told, but they can't make any sense of it, and they're driven to distraction, because before, they could have just walked down the hall to one of the court magic- magicians. Now they're stuck in prison. We've been told our future. No idea what it means. And yet, as it just so happens, in the providence of God, Joseph is familiar with dreams, having received two of his own from Yahweh. And Joseph is also a Hebrew. And as one writer points out, in every instance, when one of God's people receives a dream in the Bible, no one needs to interpret it for them. Yahweh always provides understanding. So Joseph says at the end of verse 8, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. And then in this next scene, we observe a third way Yahweh supplies when his providence takes us through long, difficult valleys. We can trust him to supply us with insight. Knowledge, wisdom, spiritual understanding, discernment, they all come from the Lord, and he grants this to his people, to his church, and so we can trust him to supply us with insight. Verse 9, the chief cupbearer tells his dream to Joseph, and it's like one of those nature show time lapses on, you know, it's fast forwarded. He sees these vines and branches, and it buds and blossoms shoot forth, and all of a sudden there's grapes on the vine. And the next thing he knows, the cupbearer, is, it, it, he has to test and taste everything that, before it goes into Pharaoh's hand, uh, and he has to be trustworthy, so the one tries to poison him. And so he sees himself putting the cup back into Pharaoh's hands like he did before. And then Joseph says to him, this is its interpretation. And this isn't coming from Joseph in and of himself. He confesses that interpretations belong to God, not to mysticism and magic and fortune tellers and the like. These are uh, despised by the Lord, condemned in his word. The future can only be revealed and understood by the one who knows and directs the future, and that is Yahweh. And so anyone else who claims otherwise is wrong, they're godless, and it's wicked. And please note, in what Joseph said, there is absolute clarity. There's no confusion. There's no guessing. There's nothing vague. This is from Yahweh. And he says in verse 12, the three branches are three days. I could not have come up with that. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. And in verses 20 and 21, we're told that this is exactly what happens. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, He made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So in this long and difficult valley, Yahweh provides Joseph with the insight needed to providentially bring about his purposes in Joseph's life and in the life of his covenant people. Now let's be honest for a minute. If it was me or you in Joseph's shoes, I think I'd be asking, why are you giving these guys dreams about something that will happen in three days? What about the dream you gave to me ten years ago? When is that going to come true? Won't you give me more? I don't understand. But Yahweh doesn't tell us all that we should wish to know. He only tells us what we need to know. In this case, the insight Joseph was given was enough to trigger events that would lead to the fulfillment of his own dreams, though not for a while longer, which is a difficult detail we'll tackle shortly. For now, our hearts and minds must settle in trusting that God has given us enough for any and every valley that his providence may lead us through. How so, you ask? You're holding it. At least I hope you are. God has given us his word, which is full of insight and counsel and wisdom and help. And he has given us his spirit so that we can understand his word. And in these last days, he has spoken to us 
through his Son. And united with Christ, we have his mind, the Scriptures tell us. And so we can grow to think as Christ does. In God's Word, he invites us to ask for wisdom when we face trials of various kinds, and he promises to grant us that to us. And in the Bible, God reveals his will to us as well. So often we're so focused on the things that God has not revealed, sometimes at the expense of the things that he has revealed. Let me just give one example to the late, the older teens, to the 20-somethings who are often wrestling through, not that anyone else doesn't, but they're often wrestling through with what is God's will for my life. Here's an example of what God's will for your life is. I'm going to tell you what God's will for your life is. It's just one example. Here's God's will for your life. Taking directly from the pages of Scripture, God's will for your life is that you flee from sexual immorality. That you use your body in a fitting way that honors the Lord. The Bible says this is the will of God for you. And if we were more focused on what is clearly revealed, pursuing God's kingdom and his righteousness first and foremost in what he has clearly revealed to us, we would find that we would get along a whole lot better in the specifics that he hasn't laid out for us because we would simply trust him and follow his direction in his word and he would lead us. He has given us everything that he needs, that we need. Spoken in the scriptures, spoken through his son, and with these we can walk with him through the valley, especially knowing that God has revealed his will for what the end of every single valley is, that we would be in his presence and the new heavens and the new, and the new earth. And he will supply us with faith to trust all that he says if Joseph responds to the interpretation is anything to go by. When Yahweh's providence takes us through long, dark, difficult valleys, we can trust him to supply us with faith. We can trust him to supply us with faith. We see that in verses 14 and 15. After giving the interpretation, notice this, Joseph is so certain of the outcome that without missing a beat, he says this to the chief cupbearer. Look at what he says. Only remember me when it is well with you. Not if, when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and to get me out of this house. Here we see just how difficult these depths have been for Joseph. He's pleading looking for a way out, as he should. But there's not a doubt in Joseph's mind that what Yahweh has revealed to the cupbearer will happen to the cupbearer. Though his surroundings shout everything to the contrary, though they've all been in prison for a long time, Joseph believes that in three days' time, this man in the prison with him will stand beside Pharaoh and put the cup into his hand. He believes it. And surely Joseph sees an opportunity, and perhaps this will be the occasion of his relief. It's been 10 years, and now he's talking with two men who have each had a dream. And the last time that happened was when he was 17, when Yahweh gave him two dreams of his own. And so in faith he pleads, remember me, do this kindness. Ken Hughes points out that Joseph has grown to instinctively turn to Yahweh. We see it in verse 8. Don't interpretations belong to God? This is just how this man operates. That's his default position. And we see it in verse 14 as well. When this happens, O oh Lord, grant us such faith to believe your word and act accordingly. And for Joseph, this is not empty piety. How many people are in prison today who would claim innocence? And how many of them would be lying? But not Joseph. His faith is backed up by his actions. 
And when Yahweh's providence takes us through long, difficult valleys, we can trust him to supply us every step of the way. He will supply us with skill. He will supply us with compassion. He will supply us with insight. He will supply us with faith. He will supply us with integrity. The Lord will shape our character to be that of righteous men and women. We can trust him to supply us with integrity. There are two ways I see this showing up in Joseph's life. The first is his statement in verse 15, where he sort of very briefly recounts what has happened to him at this point. He says, I was indeed stolen from the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Joseph is an innocent sufferer. He did nothing warranting the treatment his brother showed him in his homeland, and he has done nothing justifying his imprisonment as a foreigner in Egypt. And all this time, whether in Potiphar's house or in the prison, he can say with a clear conscience, I don't belong here. He didn't abuse his position in Potiphar's house by succumbing to the repeated temptations of his master's wife. He was innocent with respect to the false accusations she spitefully charged him with. Not a single prisoner under his care, under his oversight, could claim mistreatment. And how easy would it be, let's be honest? A guy's out of line, you're in charge, no one's looking. Give him a kick, give him a smack. But the whole entire time, Joseph has been above reproach. And he appeals to the highest authority in the land for justice. So in this we see his integrity. Secondly, Joseph's integrity shines forth in his response to the chief baker in verses 16 to 19. The chief baker is listening in, and he's hearing what Joseph is saying to the cupbearer, and he's thinking, okay, things are going to look pretty good for you. Well, what about me? The text tells us. In the dream he had, I was in it, he says. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. Boys and girls, this is both a funny-sounding dream and a delicious-sounding dream. It's funny if you picture a man with three baskets stacked on top of his head, and it's delicious if you picture the basket filled with all sorts of cakes and pies and pastries and donuts and cupcakes and breads. The Egyptians had over 58 different kinds of pastries in one sort of manual that they found. The Egyptians were amazing cooks, and Pharaoh's house would have been filled with the best of chefs. And all these things feature in the dream, but the dream's also a bit weird. Because unlike the cupbearer putting the cup back into Pharaoh's hands, the birds are, are swooping in and eating the treats from the top basket on the baker's head. And so... Some of these dreams have comparisons. Some of them don't. Again, the interpretation belongs to God. He made it clear to Joseph. And here's where we see Joseph as an honest man, a man of conviction, who won't fudge God's word, even when the truth is going to be incredibly hard to hear. He responds to the baker in verse 18, and he says, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. So far, so good. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. So far, so good. But it takes a turn. In three days, Pharaoh will lift your head from you. You're going to have your head cut off. And then Pharaoh's going to stick your body on a pole, and the birds are going to come down and eat your flesh. And in verse 22, we're told that this is exactly what happened. Kid, you probably shouldn't draw a picture of that, by the way. Verse 22, Pharaoh hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted that to them. Joseph would have made an excellent preacher. For here is a man who gets God's word straight, and he gives God's word straight. He doesn't shy away from giving the interpretation. He doesn't try to soften the interpretation. He doesn't try to change the interpretation, for he knows he has no business doing so. 
And in this, he shows himself a man of integrity, both in his conduct and in his foretelling what Yahweh foretells. Brothers and sisters, let us trust Yahweh to help us stay the course through long and difficult valleys. Let us trust him to deliver us from temptations that whisper to us to indulge ourselves in secret pleasures because life has been hard and you deserve it. God won't mind a little bit of you easing your suffering in this way. Let us trust him also to deliver us from temptations to tamper with his word as though by doing so we can make the valley easier, especially when the valley is rejection of family or of friends or even of the culture because there is something in God's word that they do not want to hear. Let us ask him for integrity in our conduct and integrity with his word and trust that he will supply this for us. And finally, let us trust him for patience. When Yahweh's providence takes us through long, difficult valleys, we do not know how long or difficult they are going to be. But we can trust him for patience, and we need to. Though Joseph trusted the interpretation, and though he took opportunity to plead with the cupbearer to appeal to Pharaoh, the final verse of chapter 40 is really deeply depressing. Look at verse 23. Twice the writer says it, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. And then look again at the beginning of chapter 41, after two whole years. Golden opportunity, right in front of Joseph for his release. And the man forgets. And two more years go by. Two whole years of a guy who could put in a good word doing nothing. Two whole years of looking up every time the prison door opens, wondering if he's finally remembered. Two whole years of wondering why these two additional dreams were given. Hence our need for patience for long-suffering, for endurance, for the fortitude to wait, as has so often been the cry of God's people recorded in the Scriptures, how long, O Lord? How long? The church through the ages, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. We are awaiting people, which means we must trust the Lord to help us to wait as he did Joseph for two whole more years before he saw the fullness of this smiling face in this frowning providence. One of the ways that God does help us is by cheering us on. I want you to hear these words of our Lord Jesus to the churches in Revelation. I'm going to capture a sentence or two from all seven of them, and you'll hear the theme. He says to the first church, Ephesus, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To the next church, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And the next, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. And to the next, to the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And to the next, the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. 
I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And to the next, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. And even to the next, which is Laodicea, he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. The Lord desires that we should endure, church, and we can cry out to him for that endurance and for that patience to not only survive, but even in ways to thrive through long and difficult valleys. Doing so, looking unto Christ, who he says to Laodicea, he conquered. How did he do so? He did it as the ultimate innocent sufferer. You were given a taste of this in Pastor Kevin's excellent biblical theology a few weeks ago, tracing Joseph's life all the way into the New Testament and the pattern that God's people go through. As we trace Joseph's life to this point when these dreadful clouds are so heavy, but ultimately with mercy that will soon rain down blessings on his head, our eyes are drawn to Christ who comes from the line Joseph was raised up in God's providence to spare. He's the ultimate innocent sufferer, and we read this about him in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to 25, which will lead us from the means of grace of the preaching of God's word to the means of grace of the Lord's Supper. Hear the connection with Joseph's innocent suffering, but let Joseph fade into the background as we hear the ultimate reason for trusting God in every long and difficult valley. It's that Jesus walked one before us. And it was more than a frowning providence that he endured. He set his face towards Jerusalem. He walked the Calvary Road. He carried his cross up the hill of Golgotha to drink the undiluted cup of the wrath of God's judgment in our place. He descended into death to lift us from the wages of our sin and from the muck of sin that we had mired ourselves in. And if you're in that pit this morning, then friend, let me compel you to look to Jesus Christ and in him you will know fully and finally the smiling face of God. Peter writes this, For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving for you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself, Peter goes on, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's because of this, brothers and sisters, because the innocent died for the guilty. Yes, we might encounter a frowning providence, but there will ever be a smiling face through any long and difficult valleys, and certainly on the other side, because of the broken body and of the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is our hope. So let's sing of him and to him before we eat and drink together. Uh, please stand with us to, to do that. Is a hope in life. 
I'm going to invite the, uh, some of our elders are going to come and uh, lead in serving. I've asked some other men as well. Uh, some of our elders are away, so I'm, some members of our church are going to come and, and, uh, and distribute the, the bread and the cup before we eat and drink together. And as we do this, uh, you, can, you, guys, brothers, you can sit for a moment. You can stand if you want, but you're free to sit. Uh, Pastor Kevin began the service by indicating that what we're doing here is publicly proclaiming who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And that's something that we certainly do as we eat and drink in remembrance of him. We are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We're doing it publicly. We're doing it together as a church. This is not a private individual experience. There's certainly an individual component to it because we each eat and we each drink, but we do it in the community of God's people, and we do it to display the riches of God's grace and kindness that he's shown to us in and through his son who died and who rose again. And so because of that, we always take a moment at the, uh, before we pass the elements, before we eat and drink, to express that the Lord's Supper, this communion aspect of our service, is for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible gives us this instruction, whoever eats the, the bread or, or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself this is how serious of a matter it is. Paul goes on to say to the Corinthian church, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died because they were not taking seriously that in eating and drinking we're participating with Christ by faith as we eat the symbol of his body, which is the bread, and as we drink the symbol of his blood, which is the cup. And so that's why we were exhorted at the beginning to consider the Lord's table and use the service as means to examine ourselves if we haven't done so before or in addition to. And so I always want to make sure that as one of your pastors, as one of your elders, that we discharge our responsibility to remind everyone that we do not eat and drink in an unworthy manner. If there's unrepentant sin that you know is sinful, that you will not confess, then I would urge you to deal with that before the Lord, before you eat and before you drink. And because we are the body of Christ, if there's anything that would hinder you from sitting down and breaking bread and passing the cup to a brother or sister, as far as it depends upon you, then I would urge you to seek mending and reconciliation in that situation before you eat and before you drink, for this indeed is a serious matter. Now to those who I know are in the room who have a tender conscience, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I sinned this morning or I sinned yesterday and maybe that means that I shouldn't eat or drink. Let me be clear in borrowing a line from another that this is not reward for the strong. This is nourishment for the weak. If you are sitting where you are and you are very willing to put up your hand and say, I am a weak and needy sinner and I have sinned and I do sin and I need the Lord's forgiving and transforming grace, then brother or sister, eat and drink and be assured of what Christ has done for you, that you might be nourished in your most precious faith. So please do keep all of that in mind as the men serve us this morning and distribute the cup and the bread. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. I'm going to invite Keith Burrow, one of our elders, is going to lead us in giving thanks for the bread. So brother, please do that. Let's give thanks for the bread together. Thank you. 